Boy. Good to be back at Solid Rock. And the rock is getting more solid all the time, huh? Yeah. Getting bigger and bigger. And I was here four years ago. Phil reminded me for Easter. This, uh, today, I, I, I haven't seen my wife yet today. She's been asleep. It was 50 years that I gave her the ring. Uh, not this one, the one she wears. 50 years ago. So I am getting old and it's amazing. You know, we still love each other. So I, I don't think I'll go to... Uh, John Mark's conference, it's, it's behind me now. You know, but you guys, if you want to marry a good looking, smart, spiritual woman like Diane, come and hear me, okay? Because look at her, she's happy and they're hugging each other and he's only 60, so that's pretty good, you know? Well, anyway, it's good to be back. This looks like a younger crowd. I don't see why. Oh, because they're lazy. I see, I see, I see. That's all the joking about sleeping in. But uh, anyway, before I get to the Bible, which I know what's, what you came for, here, Phil and Diane asked me to speak a little bit about Vietnam. Some of you prayed. We were there uh, last week. I got back on Monday. Jay Fordyce, who's the fellow who really wrote the book, Changed by Faith. I give the ideas. He does the writing. So if, if, the right, if the ideas are good, thank me. If the writing is bad, blame Jay, okay? And he's a member of this church, so you can get him anytime you want. But anyway, we were in Vietnam. Vietnam, there was a war. Most of you are too young to remember, but there was a big war. And it was terrible. Lots of bombings and killings. 50,000 Americans died. Thousands of Vietnamese. There was a lot of bombing. And so in 75, the war was over. And uh, Vietnam is a Marxist-Leninist country even now. There are many left, but that's one of them. China's another one. Albania has changed. There aren't too many. Cuba, 50-50 now. And uh, so it's a country of 90 million people, bigger than I imagined. And <clears throat> after the war, a lot of people came to Christ. Uh, Vietnam is about 80% Vietnamese, pure, so to speak, Vietnamese. And 20% are 63 uh, ethnic groups. Uh, one of them, the Mongs, are the largest. And listening to radio from the Philippines in, in short wave, reading the Bible, about 200,000 Hmongs, mountain people, were converted uh, just like that. And then there was others. Two million are now believers out of 90 million. And uh, when we were there, the government for the first time allowed a foreigner. I'm, I'm an Argentinian, but I'm an American Argentinian. I have my passport in case the immigration people show up. Uh, I see my name, Luis. Ooh, kick him out. Uh -huh. But I've got an American passport, so I'm in. Anyway, the first time they allowed an American to come back and preach in public. They had a lot of battle about it, but I got the permission. Well, there was a lot of fussing. I won't go into details. Uh, it's, it's a unique situation. With all the revolutions going on in the Middle East, there's a little bit of fear that if a big crowd gathers, you could start it over, you know? So they finally let us have a stadium uh, two weeks ago in the south. In Sa Saigon, it used to be called. Now it's called Ho Chi Minh City. And there was about 35,000 people and about 5,000 500 converted to Christ. They were given Bibles. It was a very exciting time. And then we thought, okay, now we're going to Hanoi, which is up north, the capital, and they'll probably let us do it. Well, fussing, fussing, fussing. Finally, no campaign. So we sat around and prayed a lot, and uh, it was a good time. And uh, we led a few people to Jesus Christ, but it was a very, very good thing to know. Now, I want to this morning, because we're talking about the resurrection, tell you something that happened to me chatting with a person in North Vietnam. Uh, I went to have my hair cut. There was nothing else to do. We were waiting for the permission that never came. So I thought, well, I'll have my hair done. So I go with one of the team guys. And uh, the gal in charge was a Vietnamese person. There was another one there. And so the other one left the room because there was nobody to work on. So I began to chat, as you might do when you want to get to know someone, try to understand the culture, how they, how they think about religion, and so on. And so I said to this gal, I said something I shouldn't have done, my wife always kicks me under the table, but I said, how old are you? Apparently it's a bad thing to ask. But she looked like a young chick, so I thought she liked to be asked, you know? She said, I'm 33. You know, the Vietnamese have a beautiful skin, but that's beside the point. Uh, and so I said, she's 33. Married? Yeah. Children? Yes. Seven-year-old boy. 
What does your husband do? You know, trying to get a conversation, going to share perhaps the faith if you can. And she said, oh, he works in construction, plenty of work, oh, tons of work. A Vietnam may be communist in philosophy, but it's capitalist in function. They want to make moolah. And so they, they, they got lots of economy. It's like China, just booming. And so I said, what about your dad and mom? Uh, oh, they, they're dead. Uh -huh. And your in-laws, your father-in-law, mother-in-law, they're also dead. So, you know, trying to get to understand a bit more. I said, and um, do you know where they went? And she said, no, we don't know where people go when they die. And I said, uh, but she said, but, but we talked to them. And I said, oh, do you actually talk to them? You hear their voice? She said, no, we don't hear their voice, but we talk to them. And I said, well, how do you do that? She said, well, we call uncle. Uncle is a term that is used in many parts of the world for somebody you know. It may not be your uncle, it usually isn't, but it's somebody. So uh, I said, and what do you do with uncle? And she said, well, uncle, we go to uncle, and uncle calls on the spirit of my mom and dad, and they enter uncle. And then they speak to uncle, and uncle speaks to us, and then we tell uncle what we want to tell my dad and mom, and they pass it on to my dad and mom. And I said, so you think they really hear you? She said, well, we don't know, but uncle tells us. And so uncle, of course, is a medium, a occultic person. And what they think is their parents speaking to them, because she said, the, my parents' spirits enter uncle. It isn't the parents' spirits. It's demons who enter, and demons who begin to talk, and demons who supposedly send messages back and forth. But it was so sad. And then I said, well, you know, she said, do you talk to your parents? I said, no, they're both dead, but they're in a very special place. What, what is that? Because she said, we don't know where people go when they die. I said, well, they're in heaven, in the presence of Jesus Christ and God our Creator. I don't talk to them now, but when I get there myself, we'll talk for all of eternity. And she said, oh, that's interesting. How do you get there? Anyway, the conversation unfortunately had to end because the other gal came back in and, you know, there's always a third party sticking their nose in, you know. And, uh, but at least I got going and it gave me an understanding and it made me think, as we were singing a few minutes ago, our God is mighty to save. We worship the risen King. What a difference there is when you know Jesus Christ and when you don't know him. How sad it is, my dear friends, to not know Jesus Christ because when you don't know, you don't know. And this gal was so sweet, you know, and I, I intend to send her a, a Chinese, uh, Chinese, excuse me, Vietnamese, uh, Chinese wouldn't help, uh, a Vietnamese Bible and send it to her because I know where she works right there in the hotel, where we were in the, in the gym area of the hotel. Anyway, but the thing is, she doesn't know where her parents are. She imagines that she's talking to them when actually through the medium they're talking to demons and she has no hope no expectation of anything. And in Vietnam, they call it ancestor worship. And I, at first, when she told me that, I said, oh, you're a Buddhist, because that's basically what the Buddhists believe. She said, no, 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 we're not Buddhists, we're ancestor worshipers, worshipers, which is basically the same thing with a different name. But the thing that gets you is how people are so desperate. So they go to temple, and they take candles, and they take phony money, and they take some rice, and they offer it, you know, to pacify the spirits of the dead. That's what it's all about. But the thought this morning, when we were thinking about Jesus is risen, Jesus is alive, we worship the living King, and we know that we shall see him face to face. The Bible says we shall see him and we shall know him, and we shall know as much as we are known. The hope and the reality of the risen Christ is so glorious. And I hope that this morning, before we depart, many of you will have the experience of encountering, as John Mark called it in his prayer, encountering Jesus Christ and knowing him for yourself. And so I want to read the story of a man in the Bible, a man whose life was radically, radically transformed. And he's a model for the rest of us because he was a man who was a violent man, a, a, a seriously angry man, but also highly intelligent. So let's read, if you have your Bible, in the book of Acts chapter 7. And you'll get a picture of who this fellow was and how his life was changed. And nowadays, most of the world knows who he is, even though they don't know his background. So let's read. If you have in the book, uh, it's the fifth book of the Bible of the New Testament, chapter 7, verse 54. Verse 54. And it tells you a little bit. Now, before we start reading, I'll tell you this. There's a fellow called Stephen. 
He is the first follower of Jesus that was killed. For the, if you need a Bible, they're passing them out. Anybody need a Bible? Raise your hand. The ushers are giving them away or lending them anyway. I don't know. Are you giving them away or lending them? Whatever. Steal them if you want, right? Yeah. <laughs> take them with you. Yeah. The pastor says take them. All right. He should pay for it so he knows. Uh-huh. Anyway, this guy Stephen was a young man fired up with Jesus Christ. At this point that we're going to read about right now, probably no more than a year after the resurrection of Jesus. A year. So he's fresh. This young fellow was a brilliant man. And they're about to kill him because he loved Jesus. That's all. He wasn't a troublemaker or anything. It just happened. And you will notice the name Saul as we read the, the incident. So he's been speaking to these people and suddenly they get really angry at him. He's been telling about the crucifixion of Jesus, the resurrection, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and then suddenly their fury just explodes. So let's read verse 54. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at Stephen. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at Stephen, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man, here he comes, named Saul. Now, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell on his knees, and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul was there, giving his approval to his murder, his death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. That's a big piece of land. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Now jump to chapter 9, because time doesn't allow the whole reading. Chapter 9, just turn a page or two, and let's read verse 1. The same fellow, Saul, shows up here, and you'll see the touch of the risen Christ on the life of this fellow Saul. So look at verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters for the synagogues in Damascus, Syria, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As they neared Jer Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there, speechless. They heard the sound, but they didn't see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, and when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days, he was blind and didn't eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple of Jesus called Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul for, because he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. 
And he's come here with the authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house, and he entered, and placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me, so that, one, you may see again, and two, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus, and at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. We'll have to stop right there because time doesn't allow. You can read it back home when you take a break after Easter dinner, okay? Now, this is a very important man in the history of the world. Uh, many of us believe that after Jesus, he's the greatest person ever. He wrote 14 of the books of the New Testament. But when we meet him here, before he met the risen Lord Jesus, there was another, another Saul that we need to face. The first thing is this. He made it big time. Saul was a very important man. I'll tell you in a few seconds, just in a few short phrases. He rebounded with, 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 with fame. He was from a rich family. He had a fantastic education. He studied under a professor that everybody knew, even it's in the Bible, his name is Gamaliel. It's like somebody saying, uh, my professor was Einstein, you know, that kind of a thing in the past generation. Big man, big, big doctorate in whatever. And then but this fellow came from a rich family, high education. Then he was a member of the Sanhedrin. Those were the top 70 leaders of the nation. So he was one of the top leaders uh, of the whole nation where he lived. He was also a businessman. He came from, a, obviously, he knew how to do business. Whenever he was short of cash, he would go into business wherever he was. He built tents. Tents in those days were like RVs today. I remember once when we had the, uh, the festival downtown, and the fellow from NBC, the local guy, came to interview me. And he said to me, what is this business of a bunch of businessmen and Christianity mingled together? Where did this start? And I said, well, it actually goes back 2,000 years. He said, what do you mean? I said, yeah, St. Paul was a businessman. He built RVs. He said, there were no RVs in those days. I said, yeah, in those days, tents were RVs, you okay? People took them with them and slept inside it and then picked it up and moved on. So he was a good businessman and he knew how to make money at the drop of a hat. Whenever he needed cash, he said, these hands of mine have given me all the money I need for me and those traveling. But there was this, another angle. So he was from a rich family, highly educated, successful businessman, a politician leading the nation, and then he was very religious. In fact, he uses this phrase in the book of Philippians when he's arguing with some people who are accusing him of not being a good Jew. He said, as to legalistic righteousness, I was flawless, faultless, faultless. And then he says in another place, I was ahead of all the young people of my generation. Spiritually, religiously, he was big and he was well known and so on. And you know, then the apostle Paul comes up with another statement years later. He said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. That's an interesting statement. When we get to heaven, we should have a debate to see who is the worst. I think some of you guys are probably worse. I don't know you, but I'm guessing. You know, but Paul says, I, Jesus came into the world to his sinners, and I am the worst. Now, why did he say that? Ha ha, we read a little bit, and you got enough brains to remember. He says here, first, he was a revengeful guy. I mean, for all his education and class and money and ability and position and power, he was a revengeful man. He was a bitter man. He was a ruthless soul. I mean, you notice that he says that he went from city to city, dragging people out of their homes. I mean, he's nuts. He drags people out of homes and forces, and what really made him feel guilty was he, made, he forced not just men, but women 
and force them to blaspheme Jesus Christ, to, to swear at him, and to renounce their faith. So here he is, this classy individual. If it had been today, he'd be on CNN every other week, you know. What do you think, Saul? What do you think, Saul? You know, and uh, outwardly, he was a bright guy with lots of abilities and all the rest. But there was a dark side to him, a very dark side. And you know, brothers and sisters and men and women, we all have a dark side. We hope nobody ever finds out, especially a mother-in-law, you know, that <laughs> what, what your dark side actually is. But all of us have a dark side. Uh, it may not be, your dark side may be a little better than mine, probably is. But you have your dark side. Even grannies, don't look at me like that. Even <laughs> grannies, you know. If, if a granny wrote down everything she ever thought, everything she ever said, and everything she ever did, it'd be a bestseller at San Francisco International. I tell you, and if you wrote it, it'd be worse. Because all of us have stuff in hiding that we hope nobody but God and he and his mercy forgives us. Otherwise, we're done. If it ever came out, man, oh man, you'd be chased out of town. You would run besides anybody chasing you. Because we all have it. And this man, for all his education and position and class and sophistication, which he had, he says, I was, it says he was breathing murderous threats. Nice guy to meet on the road. Here comes Saul. Yeah, you know, spitting envy. And then it says, he threw many saints into prison. And he says, he himself is saying this, when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as you notice when we read chapter 7, he was the leader of the gang because they put their clothes at his feet that killed that first, that first martyr of the Christian faith, Stephen. They stoned him to death and he stood there. He was the gang leader. Yes, kill him, kill him. Education, money, power, Religion, but murder in his heart. And you know, most of us have a dark side to ourselves too. And then it says that he went into foreign cities. He's confessing this. Nobody's pointing the finger. He says, I went into foreign cities to drag out men and women and bring them back to Jerusalem, throw them in jail. So he was a murderer. He was an angry man. And he had a dark side to him. I, I, I met a politician not so long ago in a certain city. And uh, he was very powerful, is well-known, but he got himself into real big trouble. And the newspapers in his city were just blasting away at him, making a fool out of him. Even his friends were ashamed of him. And so I felt, boy, as a Christian, I'd met him before, I should spend a little time with him. So I called up and I said to his assistant, you think, you know, so-and-so might want to meet, I'd like to spend a little time and encourage him, everybody's kicking him around, maybe we can help. So I got the call back, yep, he'll meet with you. So I went over in a private place and uh, nobody could see who was coming or going and we were alone in a room. And uh, we sat down, we had about an hour and, he's, and, and, and he, we hadn't sat down when he said, Luis, why, why, why? He says, I'm smart. I've been in politics, I think he said 17 years. I, I've been around. I know my way. Why did I do it? Why did I do it? And he was just anxious. So I said, you really want to know? He said, oh yeah. I mean, you really, really want to know why you did this? He said, yeah. I said, it's not going to be pretty. Do you still want to know? He says, I want to know. So I said, okay, this is what the prophet Jeremiah says, or God says through him. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. And I thought he's going to throw a punch at me. You know, so I got like this. I said, let me read it again, just so it penetrates. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the hearts or know the hearts. That's in Jeremiah 17, 9. And I thought, I'm going to do it one last time. I said, you really want to hear it? He said, yeah. And while I was talking, instead of throwing me a punch, he was going like this. That's me. That's me. That's me. Every phrase, and I read it so, the heart is deceitful above all things. And this guy said, that's me. That's me. And desperately wicked. That's me. That's me. Who can understand it? That's me. I, the Lord, search the heart and know the heart. And you know, dear friends, 
All of us have a dark side to us. Don't kid yourself and don't try to put anybody else on. We all have a dark side. We have all sinned, yeah. And we've all come short of God's perfection that he expected from us. So we all have a dark side that we have to deal with. That's why Saul met the resurrected Christ in a shocking moment. But I'm here to beg you, don't wait for God to shock you. Come to him before he has to shock you. Many people come to Christ in a crisis. People who know better and they should know better. But somehow it's only when they commit fraud and they sell you're going to be thrown in a penitentiary for 15 years. Or when the wife tells them where to go and walks out on them. Or where the children don't want to deal with them anymore. Suddenly they wake up. And by then it's often very late and very painful. Don't wait for a shock to come your way. Come to Christ now while you have a chance and meet the living Savior. As John Mark put it, encounter the risen Christ for yourself by faith this morning before sin and the evil heart of behavior and the dark side of you gets you into trouble. And you notice how Jesus Christ was merciful. I mean, this guy was a murderer, blasphemed Jesus Christ, forced men and women to blaspheme, to renounce him, and yet the Lord had mercy on him. And you know, no matter what your dark side may be, God loves you in spite of it. He loves me, he loves you. If everybody found out what I'm really like, you probably wouldn't shake my hand. Well, not what I'm really like, but what I think and so on. And every one of us has that. But Jesus Christ meets this man, and in a moment of crisis, he appears to him with power. And you remember, he's going on his donkey to Damascus, which from Jerusalem is a long ride. I was there in a car. That's a long ride in a car. Walking with a donkey must take a long time, you know. But in those days, it was the only Mercedes they had. So you had to get on a donkey, you know, go up there. So he's getting close to Damascus. The Bible says it was about noon, probably three days later, but about noon. And suddenly, out of the blue, there comes a crashing light, brighter than the sun at noon, and he falls off his donkey. The people around him heard the sound. They heard like a thunder, it says in one passage, and they couldn't figure out what it was. They didn't hear the actual words, but they heard the noise. They looked around. Saul is on the ground. He's blind suddenly, and he's talking to somebody they can't see. And they hear the voice that said to Saul, 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 why do you persecute me? He says, who are you, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. He says, what shall I do, Lord? Get up, go into Damascus, and they'll tell you what to do. Now, already you notice the change. I mean, here was this hot shot. I'm going to kill all those followers of Jesus, women as well as men. In fact, the women perhaps even more, because he makes a big deal about it. And suddenly, a change. Suddenly, it isn't, I'm going to get you, I hate Jesus. Suddenly, he says, who are you, Lord? What shall I do, Lord? That's the right attitude. That's real repentance. When you start being acting cocky and know-it-all, and you humble yourself and suddenly realize, I'm crazy. I've been attacking the Son of God. I thought he died. He's alive. He's talking to me. And so he gets up and he can't see. So all his buddies, all the entourage, leads him into Damascus. We're talking about Syria now. Leads him into Damascus. Three days and three nights, he doesn't eat, he doesn't drink. He's in shock. The shock that will rescue him, of course. And then Jesus appears, the risen Jesus that we celebrate today. As John Mark said, that's why we throw a party, because he's alive who's touched most of our lives, he calls to this fellow Ananias. And he says, Ananias, I want you to go to Straight Street and to this and that house, and there's a man there praying, waiting for you to show up. I appeared to him in a vision. I told him, you're going to come, Ananias, and lay hands on him, heal him, give him the Holy Spirit, and baptize him. So Ananias says, but Lord, now he's talking to the Lord. Because he's alive, just like you and I, when we worship, like Dave was saying a few minutes ago, we're worshiping the risen king. We're not nuts. We don't see him with our eyes, but we know he's here, and we love him, and he's changed us. So Ananias says, but Lord, do you realize, like the Lord didn't know, you know, that this guy is coming here with letters from the high priest so that he can kill us all. 
the Lord says, go, Ananias. He's waiting for you. So Ananias obeys. He does what the Lord told him, lays hands on him. The scales fall off his eyes. And then he baptizes him. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's a new man. They even changed his name from Saul to Paul. Saul was the old guy. Paul is the new man with the risen Jesus Christ in his life. And so the first thing he does, he eats a little food, gets a little strength. Three days and three nights without food, you lose your energy. He goes into the synagogue. And the one who came to kill the people who believed in Jesus goes to the synagogue and he preaches and he says, Jesus is the Son of God. And of course, now they want to kill him. Uh -huh. And they had, he had to escape in a, from a window outside the wall, but that's another story. That was only about three weeks later. He was running like mad. The killer becomes the preacher who then is persecuted and he tried to kill him. What a wonderful life. I mean, very exciting life, I'll say that. But notice this. The first thing is this, that Paul was instantly converted. I mean, his life was changed with one encounter with Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's the one who made us. You know, in Jeremiah 1, it says, Before I made you in your mother's womb, I knew you, says the Lord. And before you were born, I separated you. Dear friends, listen to this. Every one of us, Jesus Christ made us in our mother's womb. Sure, biologically, it's the dad and mom doing boom, boom, whatever. But uh, that, that's just the physical thing. The real you... The real, the real you is God who creates us in our mother's womb and he, we become a living spirit and a living soul. Then the body comes along, which is the house that lasts about 70, 80 years. In my case, I hope it's 92, but you never know, you know. I live in this body, but the real me is inside here and the real you is inside there. And so the Lord comes into, into Saul and makes him a new man instantly. And this noon hour right here in Beaverton, Oregon, if you've never encountered Jesus Christ, we want to give you a chance in 15 minutes to meet him, the same risen Jesus that met Saul on the road to Damascus can meet you here. Already we've had two services today, one at 8, one at 10, and that room was filled with people. Many, many of them say, I want to, I've met Jesus, explain it to me, teach me, I want to grow. And maybe today you are here and God brought you and you hardly know why you're here. Some friend invited you, somebody who cares for you. And you say, I want to meet Jesus Christ. I need a change just like the Apostle Paul did. So a new era began for Paul. Because what happens when you meet Jesus Christ is very, very amazing. I wrote down just six or seven things of the many things. The first thing is this. The resurrection of Christ brings life, life now. When you receive Christ... You receive eternal life, the life of God in the soul of man and woman. When he comes into your life, you come alive. It isn't an illusion. It isn't a theory. It's experience. And even the boys and girls. I received Christ when I was 12 years old. And I talked to a counselor, just like you can talk to one over there after the invitation. And the counselor explained to me how to receive Jesus Christ. And I did. I received, and I knew as a little boy, my father had died two years before me, before I was 12, but when I was 10, I knew I had eternal life. I wanted to be sure. And that night at age 12, February 14, 1947, in Argentina, Christ came into my life. Now I'm 76, and I'm going to tell you, it gets better every year and every decade. It gets better and better. The more you know him, the more he answers you, the more he uses you. You, you, you get closer and closer to him. And so if you open your heart to him today, the first thing is you'll know it'll be dramatic. You walk out of here knowing that you have life, eternal life as a woman, eternal life as a boy or girl, eternal life as a grandpa or grandma. You are new, and that's why it's called to be born again. The second thing that happens is that the resurrection guarantees, listen carefully, guarantees by God the Father that the work of Christ on the cross was totally accepted. When Christ died on the cross, you remember, it was many years ago. And he died on the cross, they say, April 3 of the year 33. I saw it from a professor from Cambridge last night on Fox. And uh, he was saying that he's got it worked out, this professor. April 3, 
of the year 33. So that's a few years ago. So he's in Jerusalem, and it was all pre-planned, as you know. It was prophesied from the beginning. And when he saw the plight on the dark side of us, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit planned. The Son volunteered to become a man. And he became a man through the Blessed Virgin Mary. He lived a life without sin. And then at the proper time, which was when he was about 33 years old, he went to the cross, knowing exactly what was going on. You remember they put the nails in his hands and his feet, the crown of thorns on his head. They spat on him. They slapped him around. They covered his eyes, the Roman soldiers did, and made fun of him and said, tell us who slapped you, who beat you. And they were hitting him with, uh, with their canes and so on. And then they made him drag his cross outside of Jerusalem. I've been there where they say the crucifixion took place. And you know, outside the cross, they crucified him. And you remember they put two crooks next to him, thieves and murderers, one on the right, one on the left. And while he was on the cross, the both, both thieves and criminals began to insult Jesus. If you're the son of God, why don't you get off the cross and get us off too once and for all? If you're the son of God, ha, ha, ha. And then something strange happened. You remember one of those two thieves suddenly repented. Just like Saul on his way to Damascus. Boom, something changed. And he suddenly says to his buddy, the other criminal, he says, hey, why are you insulting this man? We deserve what we're getting. We're paying for our crimes, but he's done nothing wrong. And then the, he turns to Jesus. You remember? And he says, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom? And you know, you would have thought, if it was me or you, you would have thought, this little creep. You know, he's a murderer, he's a thief, he's a criminal, and now just before he kicks the bucket, he wants me to forgive him and take him to heaven. If it was us, we would say, you go to hell. That's where you belong, you know? It's true. I mean, that's where he belonged. Uh, but, but Jesus is not like you and me. Jesus, surprisingly, just like with this fellow Saul, Instead of telling, telling him, you know, Saul, you attack me, you insult me, you blaspheme me. I'm going to show you who's king here. You're going to go to hell tomorrow. No, he offers him eternal life. And the, 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 the thief says, Jesus, remember me. when you." And Jesus says to him, truly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now you would have thought, but that's not fair. I mean, the guy's living a criminal life and at the last minute he gets forgiven and goes to heaven. You might want to live that life yourself, but you, have no, you never know when you're not going to kick it, you know, so you better not play games with God, you know. But God was merciful to him. You say, but that's not fair. Of course it's not fair. If we got what's fair, we would all be lost forever because we deserve it. We mock God. We spit in His face. Some of us have said terrible things about the Lord in our life. Some of us don't say terrible things. We just do terrible things. And God says, I still love you. And I will forgive you if you repent and believe in my Son. So He was forgiven. And the resurrection reminds us two things. One, when you receive Christ, you're forgiven as a free gift of God because He paid for it on the cross. And it says in Romans 8, listen to this. There is no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus Christ. So do you belong to Jesus Christ? Have you ever had an encounter with him? Have you ever truly said, I receive you, Lord Jesus. I surrender. Forgive me. I repent. Have you done that? If not, why not today? No better day than Resurrection Sunday. They call it Easter. I have no idea what Easter means. I don't know anybody who does. But anyway, it's a party, John Mark said, so we party. But, uh, you know, he's alive. And he's knocking at your door. And he brought you here today. He says, woman, I want you. I want to bless you. Man, I want to forgive you and make you a new man. And so the second thing is he forgets. He says in Hebrews 10, 17, and it's repeated all over the Bible, your sins, listen to this, your sins and evil behavior, says the Lord, I will remember no more. Isn't that great? He even covers for our sins. It's called atonement. It's a difficult word. Ask John Mark. But uh, it means to cover. That when God forgives you, he covers up your sin. It says, your sins are evil. Baby. I'll remember no more. Your mother-in-law may remember. But the Lord says, I will remember no more. Yeah. Mother-in-laws have a long memory. though You can't fool them. You know. I'm married to one. I know. And uh, she's my wife. Uh, 
But you know, it's beautiful to know. If you're forgiven, he'll never throw it up in your face. He'll never suddenly stop you in downtown Portland and say, yeah, I know you, you little creep. I know all about you. I could expose you and destroy you. He doesn't do that. Once he's forgiven, he says, I will remember no more. And then the third thing is, there's change. When you come to Christ, the resurrection assures that you will change. How come? Because Jesus is alive and he sends his Holy Spirit. You may say, oh, yeah, that sounds... Whew, the Holy Spirit, yes. It's the Spirit of Jesus Christ comes into your life and you change. You see, your face will look pretty much the same, perhaps a little happier, and some of you anyway. And, uh, you know, He comes into your life and the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. You know, He changes you, no question. But we change when we know Christ. Not only our, our focus is on Him, not on ourselves. We begin to love other people because we suddenly care for them because we've been so blessed. The, th the fourth thing is there's power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's what it says. Just before you went back to heaven, because after the resurrection, Jesus hung around for 40 days, and he met with his disciples and gave them the last instructions, and then just like the Bible prophesied, he went up into heaven. And then 10 days later, the Holy Spirit came down, and the, then they received power. And you will receive spiritual power. It will give you spiritual authority. It will give you freedom. You're not going to become perfect. No. That, no. You'll never, you and I will never be perfect until we see him face to face. But meanwhile, we have supernatural power to deal with our sins. And sometimes you'll stumble, but you immediately confess and say, Lord, I'm so sorry. And you're forgiven again. And you're filled with the Spirit again. And we all will stumble till the day he calls us home. And then when we see him face to face, this is what the Bible says. We shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Man, what a day that's going to be. That day will come, and that's the next thing, that we lose the fear of death. Now, it doesn't mean that you nonchalant about death. No. Death, the Bible calls, is the last enemy. So death is not a fun thing. But the, the reason we lose our fear of death is because the fear of death is Satan accusing us of sin and putting in us that fear of what's on the other side. The sad thing about my hairdresser the other day in Hanoi was that she has no idea what happens when you die. She has no idea that she's being deceived by these demons speaking through uncle. It's, it, it's, it's demons. It's not his dad and mom or her dad and mom. It's, it's just demons spitting out whatever lies they want. And people are gripped by fear. And it says in the book of Hebrews that Jesus, by dying on the cross and rising from the dead, destroyed the one who has the, the key of death, that is the Satan. And he sets free all those who by the fear of death are forever enslaved. When you don't know Jesus Christ, you don't even notice it, but some people don't want to talk about death. And even when somebody, the richest man in, in America, Warren Buffett, he is so panicky about death, his biography tells it. He loved his dad, but when his dad died, he didn't, de didn't dare go to the hospital. He didn't want to go to the burial. Finally, somebody forced him to go because he's rich and he's brilliant and he's a great investor, but he has no hope in Jesus Christ. He is a man filled with fear, even though he's so rich. And he gave $30 billion to, to what you call it, Bill Gates and his wife foundation. And he said one day, I saw it in the papers, he said, I, uh, I believe there are many ways to heaven and this surely is the best. So he signs a check. I was in Omaha where he lives and I was preaching and I, I said, Mr. Mr. What you call it, you're mistaken. There's only one way to heaven and a check doesn't do it. Ooh, the people were mad at me. But it was the truth, you know. And so tough luck. Uh-huh, on him, not me. Uh-huh. But you know, some people think, What's, what do I do about death? My dear friend, if you have Jesus Christ, you're alive. And what happens when a believer dies? His body stays on earth. My dad's body is in Argentina, in a little town called Escobar. And I visit it once in a while when I go down to Argentina. He's, I, I don't talk to him. He can't hear me, so why talk to myself? But he's in heaven. His body is still there. It's decayed. It's been 60 years. Haven't checked it out, but I'm sure. And, uh, you know, he's there. What's going to happen when Jesus comes back? It's glorious. John Mark mentioned it in passing. Jesus comes back, and the dead in Christ rise first. He will resurrect our bodies, just like he resurrected his own body. 
and we will live. And body, so, but what happens to you when you die if you're a believer? The Bible says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. You leave the body behind, which is just a temporary house. It's called a tent in the Bible, this body. Last 70 years gets pretty wobbly at 90 and 100%. You know, when you hit 100, it's just like that. From what I see, I haven't been there yet. I'm getting close. But the truth is this. The body goes to the grave. You, the real you, spirit and soul, you go straight into the presence of the Lord. And the Bible tells in 1 Thessalonians, when you come back with him, all the millions who've died believing in Jesus, all the babies, all the many people, they all come back. Our bodies are raised, boom, in the twinkling of an eye. And then body, soul, and spirit reconnect. But it's a new body, a body adapted to eternity. This body is just for earth, for that's passing, as John Mark indicated. And so we will always be with the Lord. So the fear of death, death is still an enemy, but we're not in a panic. My father died singing and clapping his hands, knowing he was dying. And he pointed it to heaven. He said, I'm going to be with Jesus. And he was gone. That's the way to die. It can be painful if you've got a bad disease, but, but you're not in a panic because you know exactly what happens. The moment your heart stops beating, you go into the presence of the Lord. Is that great or what? Huh? That's what Jesus achieved when he rose from the dead. And finally, we have that living expectation. Uh, the word is hope. Living expectation based on the promises of God that Jesus, the living one, is coming back. We don't know when. It's going to be a big surprise. A little girl once said, Jesus doesn't tell us when, he want, when he's coming back because he wants it to be a big surprise. And she was right. He wants it to be a big surprise. And then we're ready to meet the Lord and we go to be with the Lord forever. So that's the resurrection. That's why we throw a party every year, at least once. Most of us do it every Sunday, but it's a special party. And so Christ says to you today, I love you, I made you, I know your failures, I know your dark side, I took care of it on the cross. If you will surrender to me and open your heart, you can begin to live. You can know you're forgiven. You can have the peace of God. You'll become a new person. Let me come into your heart. And that's what he wants to do today. And wouldn't it be nice that from now on, you can always look back on Easter Sunday as the Sunday when Jesus Christ came into your life and made you a child of God. But you have to make that decision yourself. He's not going to push you. He's not going to kick you. He may allow you to get into a crisis, yes. But he says, to all those who receive him, who believe in his name, he gives them power to become children of God. So he's calling you today. He's brought you here to speak to your soul. And he's saying to you, it's in the Bible, my child, give me your heart. Give me your heart. And he says, you remember? He says, I stand at your door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, Jesus says, and opens the door, I will come into you and eat with you and you with me. But you have to make that decision. And this is your moment of decision. For Saul, it was a wild encounter outside of Damascus. For you today, it's right here. You can open your heart. And if you invite him into your heart, he says, I will come into you and eat with you and you with me. Have you had that encounter yet? If you haven't, this is the moment to do it. Why delay anymore? Whether you're a grandpa, a single, a mom or dad, a teenager, a, a boy or girl, he wants to come into your heart. If you want to receive him, I want to lead you in a prayer. So let's all stand for prayer before God, shall we? Let's stand in the presence of God. And I'd like to lead you in a prayer, all of you. If you've never opened your heart to Christ, you've never had that encounter with the Lord, then this is your moment to settle it once and for all. And like Saul, meet Christ and be changed. You won't even recognize yourself in five years. The change will be so great. But you have to invite him into your heart. And so I'd like to lead you in a prayer. And if you drifted away from God, and you went into the world and made bad choices, 
and you've made some severe mistakes, but today you say, I want to come home. I want to come back to my Savior. I want to come back to Christ. Then would you join us in this prayer? And for those of you who already know Christ, it's a prayer of thanksgiving because He's so good and He's done so much for us. So I'll lead you in a prayer and I'd like you to, if you feel it in your soul, pray out loud with the rest of the crowd and invite Jesus Christ into your heart. And I will guide you phrase by phrase. You just pray it out and invite Him into your life. Let's pray together. Let me hear you talking to God our Father. Oh God Almighty, thank you that you're a good God. You're a forgiving God. And today, Lord Jesus, I confess with my lips, Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead and therefore I have eternal life. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I'm yours forever because Christ lives in me. And I will serve you, Lord Jesus, and obey your holy word until I see you face to face in heaven forever. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.